Welcome to Ducky Channel. Thank you for joining me on the brief of the appellate defendant Stephen A. Avery for part four. Part G Brady Violation Re Dassey Yonda C D. On April 17, 2018, current post-conviction counsel received the Detective Michael Velli's Detective Velli CD for the first time from Prosecutor Fallon. The CD contained Detective Velli's forensic examination of the Dassey Yonda computer. On May 18, 2018, current post-conviction counsel filed a motion to supplement the record to the appellate court with the CD. On June 11, 2018, the appellate court remanded the case to the circuit court with in instructions that, quote, this appeal is remanded forthwith to the circuit court to permit Mr. Avery to pursue a supplemental post-conviction motion in connection with the Avery's receipt of the previously withheld discovery or other new evidence. The appellate court further ordered, quote, that the circuit court shall conduct any necessary proceedings and enter an order containing its findings and conclusions within 60 days of the supplemental post-conviction motion is filed. On September 6, 2018, the Circuit Court denied Mr. Avery's motion to supplement holding the, quote, the defense was in full possession of the same information as a prosecution by the seven CDs turned over pursuant to discovery. The Circuit Court also determined that the CDs were turned over to trial defense counsel two months prior to trial. Therefore, the circuit court held that Mr. Avery had failed to meet his burden of showing the evidence was suppressed. The Desayanda CD contained unique information not previously disclosed. Quote, the Brady obligation does not cease to exist at the moment of conviction, but continues to apply to the plaintiff's post-trial assertion that he did not receive a fair trial because of the concealment of exculpatory evidence known and in existence at the time of the trial, Thompson v. City of Chicago. The circuit court erred when it concluded that the CD contained exactly the same information as the seven DVDs, so nothing was suppressed. The CD contained unique information derived from Detective Velli's application of specific Hallbach crime scene facts to the raw data in the seven DVDs. The seven DVDs did not contain the results of Detective Velli's unique search terms found exclusively on the CD. Those search results are as follows, 2,632 search results for the terms blood, body, bondage, bullet, cement, DNA, fire, gas, gun, handcuff, journal, MySpace, news, RAV, stab, throat, tires. It is undisputed that the results of those unique word searches of Detective Velli were suppressed and withheld from the Trial Defense Counsel prior post-conviction counsel and current post-conviction counsel until April 17, 2018. Because there is no way possible prior to April 17, 2018 that current or prior counsel could have, quote, guessed the specific search terms and the results which Detective Velli obtained. Mr. Avery was deprived of this material information which could have established a direct link between the specific evidentiary terms related to the Hallbach murder and the searches performed on the Dasayanda computer. The CD also contained the state's, quote, recovered pornographic images relevant and material to the Hallbach murder. The CD refined the 14,099 images on the seven DVDs and recovered 1,625 violent pornography images, which had been deleted. Emphasis added, the, quote, recovered porn depicted violent images of the torture and mutilation of young females, many of whom bore a striking resemblance to Mrs. Halbach. The 1,625 images of the violent pornography could have been, could have established motive for a trial defense counsel's Denny motion. Failure to disclose CD prior to Denny ruling, the circuit court ignored current post-conviction counsel's argument that trial defense counsel was completely impaired in its ability to effectively identify a motive in its Denny motion filed on January 8, 2007 before trial. Noting evidence may be considered impermissible, withheld, if the prosecution failed to disclose the evidence before it was too late for the defendant to make use of the evidence. 
The circuit court abused its discretion when it ignored Mr. Avery's argument that his Dinny motion was compromised by the late disclosure of the state and chose to focus only on the disclosure of the seven DVDs two months before trial. Trial Defense Counsel Mr. Buting provided an affidavit to current post-conviction counsel explaining the effect of the late disclosure on the success of Trial Defense Counsel's Denny motion regarding establishing the motive of Bobby. Mr. Buting states, We established that he, Bobby, had access and opportunity to have committed the crime, but the court ruled no motive was established and therefore denied the Denny motion as to Bobby Dassey and others. If there was anything that was that was on the CD investigator report from Detective Veli that would have linked Bobby Dassey to the violent porn images found on the Dassey computer, we would have included such information in our Denny motion. Such information could have strengthened Bobby Dassey as a possible suspect who may have sexually assaulted and killed Miss Albach and specifically would have provided evidence of a motive. Misleading Nature of the Disclosure by Prosecutor Kratz the state admits that the CD was suppressed from May 10, 2006 until the state disclosed it to current post-conviction counsel on April 17, 2018, exactly 4,360 days after it was created by state's forensics examiner. The circuit court ignores Mr. Avery's argument that his trial defense counsel was deliberately misled by Prosecutor Kratz. In Prosecutor Kratz's December 4, 2006 letter, he did not disclose the CD, but did disclose the December 7, 2006 Thomas Fassbender Report, quote, Fassbender Report. The Fassbender Report was prepared 218 days after Detective Valley's final investigation report was completed for the state on May 10, 2006. Mr. Strain provided an affidavit and raised additional issues about the state's non-disclosure of the CD. On January 25, 2007, on the eve of the trial, Attorney Strain received a document entitled Stipulation Project from Prosecutor Kratz. In that document, paragraph R stated, quote, Computer analysis of Steve Teresa's and Brendan's computer, Mike Billy of the Grand Shoot PD analyzed the hard drives of these three and found nothing of evidentiary value. We may wish to introduce the fact that they looked. This step eliminates Officer Vili as a witness. Mr. Strain's affidavit states in relevant part, I accepted without challenge King Kratz's assertion in a January 25, 2007 email to me that Belly's analysis of Steve Treasis and Brendan's computers yielded, quote, nothing much of evidentiary value. With the belated production of the Belly forensic analysis to Mr. Avery's current lawyers in April 2018, it now appears to me from materials that Mrs. Zellner and co-counsels have filed that the Belly forensic analysis, in fact, did include much of evidentiary value in direct contradiction to Mr. Kratz's claim. Given what I know now about the existence and content of the Belly forensic analysis, this, this looks to me like deceit. My firm and I did not have in case while representing Mr. Avery. I think that Mr. Buting did not either, so we could not review the data on the seven DVDs given to us. Of course, we never got the Belly CD-ROM at all. The circuit court abused its discretion when it found that trial defense counsel had failed to exercise reasonable due diligence in the following ways. Number one, failed to request access to the in-case program from the prosecution and, quote, was denied such access. Number two, failed to request the missing CD when they had notice of the existence of the Valley CD by a fast vendor's report prior to trial. Number three, failed to submit a motion to the court requesting additional time to review the newly discovered evidence. The Wisconsin Supreme Court in the state versus Weirski has specifically rejected the imposition of a reasonable diligence standard on trial defense counsel. The Wisconsin Supreme Court specifically stated, this court has never analyzed a Brady claim through the lens of, quote, reasonable diligence, and we decline to adopt that requirement now due to its lack of grounding in Brady or other United States Supreme Court precedent. In Banks v. Dredke, 
the United States Supreme Court specifically instructed, quote, a rule thus declaring prosecution may hide and defendant must seek is not tenable in a system constitutionally bound to accord defendants due process. The state should not be allowed to impose a reasonable diligence standard on a trial defense counsel when the state suppressed the Ville CD for 12 years. Exclusive Possession and Control the Weyerski Court specifically overruled prior Wisconsin cases which have imposed a requirement of exclusive possession and control of the material evidence by the state. The court specifically stated, There is no express support in the United States Supreme Court Brady's jurisprudence for the limitation that only favorable material evidence and exclusive possession and control of the state must be turned over to satisfy the due process obligations ununiciated in Brady. This limitation further thwarts the purpose of the state's obligation under Brady to prevent the state from withholding favorable material evidence that helps shape a trial that bears heavily on the defendant and casts a prosecutor in the role of an architect of proceeding that does not comport with the standards of justice. Brady, 373 U.S. We hereby overrule the holding set forth in Nelson 59 and its progeny that favorable material evidence is only suppressed under Brady, where the withheld evidence is in the state's exclusive possession and control. Suspiciously, the Dassey Yonda CD was not accessible to trial defense counsel in the prosecutor's file because the CD was kept in the exclusive possession of S.A. Fassbender. Even if trial defense counsel had searched the prosecutor's files, they would have not discovered the CD. The knowledge, the knowledge of law enforcement officers may be imputed to the prosecutor. The test is whether by the exercise of due diligence the prosecutor should have discovered it. Prosecutor Kratz knew that the CD was being kept separately from the other discovery and was in the sole possession of S.A. Fassbender. The Weyerski Court noted, the exclusive possession and control, reasonable diligence, and intolerable burden limitations distort the original Brady analysis and the purpose behind the prosecutorial obligations enunciated in Brady. The state, in its response to the motion to supplement, contended that multiple people had access to the computer, but current post-conviction counsel has provided sufficient evidence that it was only Bobby who had access to the computer during the day on weekdays. If the circuit court had conducted an evidentiary hearing the issue of who had access to the Dassey Yonda computer during the week from 6.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. could have been definitively established through witness testimony. Current post-conviction counsel has asserted, based on her forensics computer expert, Gary Hunt's Mr. Hunt analysis, that the violent searches primarily occurred on weekdays when only Bobby was in the residence. It is undisputed that Mr. Avery never accessed the Dassey computer. He did not have the password for the computer, nor did he possess a key to the Dassey residence, which was locked when no one was home. Mr. Avery only entered the residence with the permission of the Dassey family member. Mr. Avery worked during the weekdays from 8 o'clock a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. Mr. Avery would be eliminated from all but 15 of the 128 searches at issue simply by having been arrested on November 9, 2005. Brendan would have been eliminated from all but 26 of the 128 searches at issue by having been arrested on March 1, 2006. The Wisconsin Supreme Court in Harris stated, Here, the undisclosed information is not directly exculpatory in the sense that DNA evidence might be because the fact that BMM had alleged being previously sexually assaulted by her grandfather does not, in and of itself, tend to negate Harrison's guilt regarding the separate assault that BMM alleged he committed. However, the evidence here constitutes impeachment information that could be used to challenge the credibility of the witness whose credibility would have been determinative of Harris's guilt. Similar to Harris, of all of the witnesses in Mr. Avery's trial, Bobby's testimony was the most determinative of Mr. Avery's guilt because the state used it to establish that Mrs. Halbach never left the Avery property. Clearly, the jury was concerned about Bobby's credibility because he was one of the only two witnesses whose testimony the jury requested to review during deliberations.
Importantly, the CD timeline of internet searches directly contradicts Bobby's trial testimony that on October 31st he was asleep from 6.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Mr. Hunt determined that the internet on the Dasi Yonda computer was accessed on October 31st, 2005, when only Bobby was in the home at 6.05 a.m., 6.28 a.m., 6.31 a.m., 7 o'clock a.m., 9.33 a.m., 10.09 a.m., 1.08 p.m., and 1.51 p.m. This impeaches Bobby's trial testimony that he was asleep from 6.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. On November 17, 2017, in a recent interview of Bobby by state investigators, Bobby claimed that the computer was located, quote, on a desk in the living room at the time. When Bobby was asked if the computer was ever located in his bedroom, he stated, it was not. Bobby's statement is directly contradicted by the crime scene footage taken by Sergeant Tyson on November 12, 2005, which shows the computer was located in Bobby's bedroom. Bobby's statements are further contradicted by his brother, Blaine, who stated in his affidavit to current post-conviction counsel on June 25, 2018, that the computer was located in Bobby's room and Bobby was the primary user of it. The suppressed impeachment evidence on the Dasi Yonda CD is not, quote, largely cumulative of an impeachment evidence petitioners already had and used at trial, nor is it simply impeachment evidence which only involved minor witnesses. As the Seventh Circuit Court points out in Sims v. Hyatt, the Brady materiality standard is not an admissible test. Quote, it requires the court to gauge the potential effects on the outcome of the trial if the concealed information has been available to the defendant. Bobby was a primary witness for the state in establishing that Mr. Avery and not he was the last person to see Miss Hallbach alive. Bobby's credibility would have been severely diminished if the jury realized that Bobby was doing the following searching and viewing numerous images of young females who bore a striking resemblance to Miss Hallbach being tortured and sexually assaulted. Bobby was also lying to the jury about sleep being sleep when he was doing internet searches. Bobby was searching for key terms relevant to murder and created folders labeled, quote, Teresa Hallbach and DNA. The violent pornography on the Dasi Yonda CD fulfills the Denny mode of requirement and therefore meets the materiality standard of Brady. Because the circuit court erred in its finding that the seven DVDs and CD were identical and therefore there was no suppression, it never reached the materiality issue of the CD's contents for Brady purposes. Wisconsin Statute 904.04 provides that evidence of other crimes and or wrongs and or acts when offered as proof of motive, opportunity, intent, preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, or absence of mistake or accident is admissible. The court in Dresler v. McCartry held that the acts admitted pursuant to this section were the defendant's possession of the pornographic videotapes and pictures. Those images depicting intentional violence were admitted as evidence of the defendant's motives, intent, and plain plan to murder the victim. The defendant in Dresler argued that the videotapes and pictures were irrelevant and constituted inadmissible propensity evidence. The Seventh Circuit disagreed, stating, the fact that the defendant maintained a collection of videos and pictures depicting intentional violence is probative of the state's claim that he had an obsession with that subject. A person obsessed with violence is more likely to commit murder, and therefore the videos and photograph photographs are relevant. The Dresler court also rejected the defense's argument that the videos and pictures were inadmissible propensity evidence and held that although evidence of the general character of a defendant is inadmissible to prove he acted in conformity therewith, the above exception from 904.04 was deemed to apply. Dresler is persuasive authority that the same result should occur here. Mrs. Halbach was killed in a violent and vicious manner. An obsession with images depicting sexual violence against women made it more likely that person would commit a sexual homicide. The violent sexual images were relevant to motive and would have resulted in trial defense counsel being able to establish motive to meet the Denny standard. As Mr. Avery's expert on sexual homicide, Anne Burgess, Ph.D., opines in her affidavit, Relying upon 30 years of empirical research literature, there is a well-established casual connection between pornography consumption and violent behaviors.
The Brady violations are newly discovered evidence that meet the Brady materiality standard. The decision to grant or deny a motion for a new trial based on newly discovered evidence is committed to the trial court's discretion. State v. Blue. When moving for a new trial based on the allegation of newly discovered evidence, the defendant must prove 1. The evidence was discovered after conviction. 2. The defendant was not negligent in seeking the evidence. 3. The evidence is material to an issue in the case. and 4. The evidence is not merely cumulative. The Court in State v. Volbrett At the outset, we observe that the parties parse out the issues on appeal, addressing the newly discovered evidence, third-party perpetrator Denny evidence, and the alleged Brady violations as if disconnected. However, overarching issue is that of newly discovered evidence under which all other issues on appeal are subsumed. We therefore examine it as such. In this case, the contents of the Valley CD qualify as new evidence because 1. The CD was first disclosed to current post-conviction counsel in 2018 after being withheld for 12 years. Number 2. Whatever duty Mr. Avery's trial defense counsel was under to investigate the Valley CD was superseded by the prosecution's ongoing duty to disclose and not suppress evidence. Number three, the evidence, i.e. recovered pornographic images and 2,632 searches for keywords related to the murder of Ms. Hobbock, provided by Detective Valley, was material to the trial court's consideration of Denny evidence related to Bobby. Number four, in the evidence specifically, the aggravated pornography images and Detective Valley's keyword searches was not cumulative of the seven DVDs tendered to trial defense counsel. Rather, this evidence constitutes a unique work product that is not merely a re-evaluation of existing evidence or new application of known evidence. The Valley CD was material. In order for the defendant to prevail on the third component of the Brady analysis, the suppressed evidence must be material. The evidence is material only if there is a reasonable probabil probability that had the evidence been disclosed to the defense, the result of the proceeding would have been different. It is not difficult to imagine what Mr. Avery's trial defense counsel could have done at trial with the knowledge of a violent pornography searches performed on the Dassey Yonda computer by Bobby, the state's primary witness. The court in Sims states, Courts must consider the overall strength of the prosecution case, the importance of the particular witness's credibility to the prosecution case, the strength of the concealed impeachment material, and how the concealed material compares to other attacks the defense was able to make on the witness's credibility. Bobby's trial testimony was completely unrebutted by the defense. The suppressed impeachment evidence contained in the CD was material because it was not, quote, largely cumulative of impeachment evidence petitioners had already used at trial, and because the impeachment evidence was of the state's primary witness. Mr. Avery had a constitutional guaranteed right to present a complete defense to the charges against him. Mr. Avery was deprived of his constitutional right to present a complete defense because of the Brady violation committed by the state in failing to tender the forensic examination CD and report of Detective Veeley entitled Dassey Computer Final Report Investigative Copy. The failure of trial defense counsel to have the benefit of using the CD to establish the Denny motive requirement as it pertained Bobby and or to impeach Bobby the state's primary witness deprived Mr. Avery of a meaningful opportunity to present a complete defense. The cumulative effect of the Brady violations establishes materiality. In addressing a Brady claim, the court is not to view each piece of suppressed evidence in isolation. Instead, the court is required to assess the cumulative impact of all the suppressed evidence to determine its materiality. Kyles v. Whitley, suppressed evidence is material if its cumulative effect creates a reasonable prob probability of a different result at trial. A reasonable probability of a different result exists if the suppressed information undermines confidence in the verdict. The Kyles court noted, quote, the question is not whether the defendant would more likely than not have received a different verdict with the evidence, but whether, in its absence, he received a fair trial understood as a trial resulting in a verdict worthy of confidence, a, quote, reasonable probability.
probability is lower than a preponderance of evidence standard. It is demonstrated where the defense shows that the failure, quote, undermined confidence in the conviction. Youngblood v. West Virginia. For example, in Bice v. Sheldon, the defendant was convicted for kidnap, assault, and murder. In addressing the cumulative impact of the undisclosed evidence, the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit noted that, had the evidence been disclosed to the defense, it would have allowed defense counsel, quote, to construct a plausible alternative narrative of the crime. Specifically, witnesses reported seeing a group that may have included the victim taunting Cadre close in time to the victim's murder. Police had determined that Cadre's palm print was similar to the print found at the scene, and one witness noted that Cadre had injuries to his knuckles after the murder. In vacating the defendant's conviction, the court held, quote, These facts, had they been disclosed, would have provided a compelling counter-narrative to the state's theory of the case and could have created a reasonable doubt as to the defendant's guilt in the minds of the jurors. The undisclosed evidence to Mr. Avery would have permitted the defense to construct a plausible alternative narrative of the crime. As stated previously, Mr. Ramlow and Mr. Redont's testimony and the unedited flyover video would have established that the RAV4 was planted on the Avery property. The missing zipper voicemail and the undisclosed Heidel report would have changed the state's timeline of Ms. Halbach's activities and would have provided evidence establishing Mr. Hillegas as a Denny third-party suspect. The undisclosed Dassey Yonda CD would have impeached Bobby, who was impeached at the state's primary witness, as well as established motive to name him as a Denny third-party suspect. Because the days are going to whisper And the months are going to talk Until the years yell out the truth Time will tell Time will tell When a train whistles far away 